Thank you. Uh, thank you for attending our session, Android meets TensorFlow. I'm Kazu Sato. I'm a developer advocate for Google Cloud Platform team. And hello, good morning. Thanks for coming in very, very early morning. So I'm not a morning person, so I'm a bit sleepy now. Anyway, yeah, my name is Hakura Matsuda. I'm a developer advocate of the Android gaming and native technology. OK. So today, in this session, I'd like, we'd like to discuss these topics. So for the first part of the sessions, I will be discussing what is AI, machine learning, neural network, and deep learning, and how Google has been using this, that kind of technologies for implementing our services, and what is the TensorFlow, that is an open source library for building your own neural network. And then I will pass the stage to Hack. He'll be discussing how you can build the, the Android applications powered by TensorFlow and how you can optimize it. And lastly, I'd like to do a sneak preview of the new technologies, such as uh, TensorFlow Lite and Android Neural Network API. So what is machine learning and neural networks? How many people actually try neural network by yourself? How many people? Oh, so many people. Like a 20 to 20%. And how many people actually use the neural network on mobile devices? Oh, oh, thank you so much. I found like a 10, over 10 people. OK, today I would like to uh, learn how you can uh, use the TensorFlow and mobile, uh, machine learning model running inside mobile applications. And there has been so many buzzwords such as AI, or machine learning, or neural network, or deep learning. Uh, we have been hearing about those buzzwords for the last few years. Now, what's the difference? The AI, or artificial intelligence, you can say that is a science to making a th smart things, like uh, building an um, autonomous driving car, or uh, having computer drawing a beautiful picture, or composing music. And one way to realize that vision of AI is the machine learning. Machine learning is a technology that where you can let the computer uh, train itself. Uh, rather than having a human programmers instructing every step uh, to uh, how to process the data by itself. And one of the uh, many different algorithms in machine learning is neural networks. And since around 2012, we have been seeing a big breakthrough uh, in the world of the neural networks, especially for the image recognition, voice recognition, or the natural language processing, and many other uh, the applications. And at Google, we have been focusing on developing the uh, neural network technologies yeah. for several years. So what is neural networks? You can think it's just like a function in mathematics or a function in programming language. So you can put any kind of data as an input and do the, some uh, uh, the matrix operations or calculations inside neural networks. Then eventually, you would get an output vector, which has the uh, many labels or speculated values. For example, if you have a bunch of images, and you can train the neural networks to crash by which one is the image of a cat or image of a dog? And this is just an, an one example of the use cases of neural networks. You can apply the technology to solve any kind of the business problems you have. For example, if you have a bunch of the gaming servers, then you can try converting the all the user activities or player activities converted into a bunch of numbers, such as vectors and try training the neural networks to crash by the types of the players on your gaming server. Uh, for example, if you want to find any uh, cheating player who will be using the automated script to try to cheat on your server, or you can try to use the neural networks to find the premium players who could be buying more and more items from your gaming server. So that is uh, just one example, possible example of the, the possible thousands of the applications. And at Google, we have been using the deep learning technologies for uh, implementing the uh, smart uh, functions on over 100 production projects, including Google Search, or Android, or Play, and many other applications. For example, if you are using Google Search every day, that means you are accessing the deep learning technologies provided by Google every day, because 2015, uh, we have introduced RankBrain, which is a deep learning-based ranking algorithms. That generates the signals for the uh, defining and ranking of the search results. 
And if you take a look at the, uh, the mobile applications from Google, for example, Google Photos is one of the most successful mobile applications that has been using deep learning for analyzing and understanding what's the content of each image is taken by the, your smartphones. So you don't have to put any tags or keyword uh, by yourself. Instead, you can just type dog or your friend's name or the wedding party to find the uh, images based on this content. Smart reply is a feature uh, that shows the uh, options to reply to each email thread. So it uses the natural language processing uh, powered by the neural network model to try to understand the context uh, of the email exchanges. And now the over 12% of the uh, responses are generated by the smart reply features. So you can say that now email has been written by the computers and not by humans anymore. Google Translate app recently introduced a new neural translation model that has improved the uh, quality, especially the fluency of the translated text significantly. So there are so many uh, possible use cases for the combination between machine learning and mobile applications, starting from the image recognition, OCR, or speech-to-text-to-speech, -to -text -to -speech, or translation, NLP. And especially, uh, you can apply the machine learning for the mobile-specific applications, such as the motion detection or GPS location tracking. And why you want to run your mo machine learning model or neural network model inside your mobile applications? Because by using the machine learnings, you can reduce the significant amount of the traffic, and you can get a much faster response from, from the cloud services because you can extract the uh, meaning from the raw data. What do you mean by that? Uh, for example, if you are using the machine learning for image recognition, easiest way to implement that is to send you all the raw image data taken by the, the ca camera to the server. But instead, you can have the uh, machine learning model running inside your mobile application so that you your uh, mobile application can recognize what kind of the object uh, in the, uh, each images, so that you can just send the uh, label, such as flower or human face, to the server. So that can reduce the uh, traffic to one tenth or one hundredth. It's a significant amount of the savings of the traffic. Another inter uh, e example could be a motion detection. So if you're uh, gathering all the motion sensor data, now sending the just raw images to directly to the server, you can use the machine learning algorithms to extract the uh, so-called feature vectors. Feature vector is just a, just a bunch of the numbers, like 100 or 1,000 uh, numbers. That represents the uh, characteristic or signature of the motions uh, uh, from the motion sensors. So you can just send the 100 or 1,000 uh, numbers in the feature vector to the server. And to, what is the start, starting point to build your own mobile application that is powered by machine learning? The starting point could be the TensorFlow, which is the open source library for machine intelligence from Google. And TensorFlow is the latest framework for the building the machine learning or AI-based services developed in Google. And we have open sourced it in November 2015. And now, TensorFlow is the most popular framework for the building neural network or deep learning in the world. And one benefit you could get with TensorFlow is ease of development. So it's really easy to get started. You can just write a few lines of Python code or tens of lines of Python code to define your neural network by yourself. And actually, TensorFlow is, uh, this technology is really uh, valuable for people like me. Uh, because I don't have any uh, the sophisticated mathematical background. So when I was reading, started reading the textbook of neural networks, uh, I found many uh, mathematical equations on the textbook, uh, like a differentiation or backpropagation or gradient descent. And I really didn't want it to implement everything by myself. Instead, now you can just download TensorFlow, and where you can write the single line of Python code like gradient descent optimizer. 
So that single line of code can encapsulate all the sophisticated uh, algorithms such as gradient descent or back propagation or any other latest algorithms implemented by the Google engineers. So you yourself don't have to uh, have the skill set to implement the neural network technologies from scratch. Also, the benefits uh, of the uh, TensorFlow is the portability and the scalability. For example, if you're just getting started with the technology, you can download the TensorFlow on your Mac or Windows, where you can play with the Hello World kind of the very simple samples. But if you're getting serious about the technologies, for example, if you want to train the model from scratch to recognize an image of a cat, then yeah, you may want to use a GPU server, because GPU is like a 10 or 50 times faster than CPU or Mac or Windows to train your model. But the many large, large companies, like uh, Google or any other enterprises, are using tens or sometimes hundreds of GPUs running on the cloud, because the uh, computing power is the uh, largest challenge for the, for the deep learning technologies. But still, you don't have to make uh, any major changes on your TensorFlow uh, neural networks, because TensorFlow is designed to be scalable. So once you have defined your neural networks, you can learn it, train it, and use it on a single CPU or multiple GPUs or hundreds of GPUs, or TPU or tensor processing unit, which is uh, the, uh, the ASIC or customized LSI designed by Google. And once you have finished the training of your model, you can copy the model, which has about, <coughs> for example, for image recognition, the single model can consist of the 100 megabytes of the data, the parameters. You can copy those parameters to the mobile devices, such as Android, iOS, or Raspberry Pi. And if you go to the tensorflow.org website, you can find the uh, sample code for those the embedded systems and mobile phones. And then the benefit you could get from TensorFlow is the community and ecosystems. So if you want to find uh, any practical production quality solutions, then the, the TensorFlow can provide the best answer for that. Because there are so many large enterprises and developers who are using the TensorFlow for serious development, such as Airbus or ARM or eBay, Intel, Dropbox, Twitter. They are all using Twi uh, TensorFlow. Now I'd like to pass the stage to Hack, uh, who will be talking about how you can implement the Android applications powered by TensorFlow. OK. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kazu. So uh, let's move on to the Android part. As Kazu mentioned, we have found a lot of great use cases of running TensorFlow inference on mobile devices. Let's take a look how we can integrate TensorFlow inference on mobile devices and how we can optimize it. TensorFlow supports multiple mobile platforms, including Android, iOS, and Raspberry Pi. In this talk, we would like to focus on mobile devices, like uh, Android and iOS. Building a TensorFlow shared object from scratch was a bit tricky, required multiple st steps, starting from Git clone from GitHub, install Bezel, install Android Studio, Android SDK, NDK, and finally editing a setting file, etc. But we have a good news today. Announced this I.O., we just added a JSON integration, which makes the steps a lot, a lot easier. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> so just add one line to the build Gradle, and Gradle takes care of the rest of the steps. Under the library archive, holding TensorFlow shared object is downloaded from JSON, linked against your application automatically. Also, you can fetch pre-built model files, such as the inception, stylize, etc., from the cloud as well. And it's easier for iOS as well. We just added a CocoaPod integration as well. It's 
quite simple now. Let's take a look how you can use the TensorFlow API. We released Android inference library to integrate TensorFlow for Java application. The library is a thin wrapper from Java to the native implementation, and the performance impact is minimal. At first, create TensorFlow inference interface, opening the model file from the asset in the APK. Then, set up the input feed using feed API. On mobile, the input feed tend to be retrieved from various sensors, like a camera, accelerometer, etc. Then, run inference, and finally, you can fetch the result using fetch method over there. You would notice that those calls are all blocking calls. So you would want to run them in a worker thread rather than the main thread, because API would take a long, long time, like uh, several seconds. This one is the Java API. And of course, you can use regular C++ API as well, if you love C++ as I am. Um, OK, let's move on to the demo. So uh, this one is a TensorFlow sample running on Android. The sample has three modes. First one is running Inception V3 that classifies a camera image. And also, we have classified face and a stylized photo sample. This one is a stylized photo that is applying the um, artistic filter on the camera preview. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, one thing, one special thing on the demo is that uh, I tweak the demo a little bit using the GPU, using Vulkan Compute Shader. That way, it's a regular sample just supports the CPU and the NEO optimization, but uh, I tweaked that using the GPU. And, uh, this one was just for experiment and just for fun. That was pretty fun. And uh, I learned a lot to optimize uh, TensorFlow for GPU. Uh, basically, uh, on Android devices, um, performance limiting factor is mostly coming from the memory bandwidth rather than computing itself. So that uh, reducing memory bandwidth helped a lot. For instance, in some convolution 2D kernel, it was fetching the 32 by 32 by 32 by 4 samples just to generate one, um, one output value, which is a huge amount of data from the viewpoint of the computer shader. So memory bandwidth is the key, crucial for the Android and mobile device optimization. Anyway, uh, everybody can tweak TensorFlow code because it's open sourced. It's a beauty of open source, right? So now we can integrate TensorFlow inference on mobile quite easily, as I explained. However, there are still be challenges, performance. Even the mobile device performance has been increased significantly. It has less computing power than cloud or desktop counterpart. Also, it has limited RAM, which is a precious resource on mobile. Let's say if your application takes a one gigabyte of RAM, then your application is highly likely to be killed by the system itself when the application goes to background. That's not a happy situation, right? So. Let's take a look how we can optimize TensorFlow graphics, reducing the memory footprint, 
increases the runtime performance and improves the load time as well. So this one is the model of the Inception V3 model. The model takes around 91 megabyte in storage with uh, 25 million parameters, and the binary size would take uh, 12 megabytes. That is a uh, huge. And we have multiple techniques to optimize the graph, such as the freezing graph, and using the graph transform tool, quantization, memory mapping, etc. Let's go through. Freezing graph is uh, one of the load time optimization, which convert variable node into constant node. What's a variable node? In TensorFlow, variable nodes are stored in different file, but the constant file, constant node is included in the graph def itself. So moving a variable into the constant node can concatenate multiple files into one file, like Apple Pen. That would be a slight performance win in mobile and easier to handle. To do that, uh, we prepared freezegraph.python script. And the graph transform tool is your friend. The tool supports various optimization tasks, such as uh, stripping unused node files inference, but used only in the learning phase. When learning the inference node, those are not necessary. A thing is that currently, it would require some manual steps to determine which node is the start node and which node is the output node. So the tool requires both start and the output point specified manually. Let's talk about quantization. Neural network operation requires a bunch of matrix calculations, which means tons of multiply and add operation. Current mobile devices are capable of doing some of them with specialized hardware, for instance, SIMD instruction in CPU, general purpose computing in GPU, DSP, etc. Roughly, on mobile CPU, it can perform around 10 to 20 gigabyte flops in total. And using GPU, it would achieve 300 to 500 gigaflops or more. That sounds a great number, but still less than a desktop or server environment, so that we want to perform some optimization. Quantization is one of the techniques to reduce both memory footprint and the computer load. Usually, TensorFlow takes a single pressure floating value for input and mass and also output as well. As you know, single precision floating point takes 32 bit each. But we found that we can reduce the precision to 16 bit, 8 bit, or even less while keeping a good result. That's because a learning process involves some noise by nature, and adding some extra noises wouldn't matter much. So a quantized weight is the optimization for storage size, which reduces the precision of the constant node in the graph file. But uh, please note that uh, quantized weight, with the quantized weight optimization, the value will be expanded on memory when the graph is loaded. So we have another optimization. We can call it the quantized calculations. With the quantized calculations, we can reduce the computing precision by using the quantized value directory. This one is good for both memory bandwidth 
which is a limiting factor in mobile devices. Also, hardware can handle less precision values faster than single precision floating value. But we still have an open issue. To, the, to do the quantized calculation, we need a maximum value and a minimum value that specify the range of the quantized values. We still don't have a great solution for that. It's still manual, but uh, active research is uh, going on, so that uh, hopefully uh, this issue will be resolved pretty soon. This one is an example how quantized calculation optimization works in TensorFlow. TensorFlow has some operations that support quantization. For instance, uh, convolution 2D, matrix multiply, LEDU, et etc. We think that's uh, good enough to cover most of the inference scenarios. However, we still don't have all of the operations quantized yet. So that we need to quantize the value and dequantize value output right before and after each node. And the graph transform to analyze the path of the each graph node. And sometimes we can reduce unnecessary quantize and dequantize value. Memory mapping is uh, yet another optimization for loading time. With this optimization, the model file is converted and can be mapped directly using the memmap API, which could be slightly performance optimization on some Linux kernel-based operating system like Android. Another one is uh, reducing executable size. That's an important topic mobile as well, because on mobile devices, executable package size is limited to specific size. For instance, Android, um, 100 megabytes for Android, including binary and the graphics and the any other resources. By default, mobile device supports multiple selected operations that is mostly good enough to cover inference operations, but ops used learning process is missing. So if you want to do the learning on mobile device, you need to register, register extra operations. Also, if your graph wouldn't require some of pre-registered operations, you would also remove some of them to do that, you can do the selective registration. So for instance, for Inception v3, by doing the selective registration, the binary size, original binary size was 12 megabytes. And after the optimization, it can be reduced to 1.5 megabytes. Note that uh, this optimization requires uh, rebuilding the shared object in your local. So you would need to construct the build environment as well. So with these optimizations, now Inception v3 graph now becomes 23 megabytes and 1.5 megabytes in binary size which is 75% uh, smaller now. Okay. Let's get back to Kazu. Thank you, Hak. So as Hak mentioned, there are so many. <laughs> Thank you. As Hak mentioned, there are so many uh, uh, tips and tricks to optimize your TensorFlow uh, model to squeeze into an uh, Android application, mobile applications. And that is what you can do right now. These techniques are available right now. But now I'd like to discuss a little bit about the new technologies coming in the new future, such, such as TensorFlow Lite and Android Neural Network API. What is NNAPI? 
It's a new API for neural network processing inside Android, and that will be added to the Android framework. And the purpose of the adding a new API is to encapsulate and uh, have an abstraction layer for the hardware accelerators such as GPU, DSP, and ISP. And modern smartphones have the, uh, such a powerful computing resource other than CPU, such as GPU or DSP. Especially the DSP is designed to do a massive amount of the matrix and vector calculations. So it's much faster to use DSP or GPUs to, to do the uh, neural networks inference on it rather than using a CPU. But why right now, if you want to do that, uh, you have to uh, go directly into the uh, library provided by the hardware vendors and build uh, some binaries by yourself. It's so tedious task. And also, it's not portable. So instead, we'll be providing a standard API so that developers don't have to be aware of any uh, uh, the hardware accelerators for, from the each individual vendors. And on top of the neural network API, we'll be providing TensorFlow Lite that will be a new TensorFlow runtime optimized for mobile and embedded applications. So TensorFlow Lite is designed for smart and compact mobile or embedded applications. And also, it is designed to be combined with the uh, Android NN API. So all you have to do is to build your model with an, a TensorFlow Lite, and that's it. So eventually, you will be getting the, all the benefits you could get from the Android NN API, such as the hardware acceleration. So that will be coming as an open source in the near future, so stay tuned. And if you are interested in these new coming technologies, uh, please take a photograph of this QR code so that you can um, join the, our survey for the um, ML on Android, where you can give your feedback or uh, uh, request for the uh, new products. <laughs> okay. OK, thank you. <laughs> so lastly, I'd like to show some very interesting and fun applications, real-world applications built with the TensorFlow on mobile and embedded systems. The first application is, is running on the Raspberry Pi, built by a Japanese cucumber farmer. So they are the, the, actually, I, by myself, took these photographs. I went there to the cucumber farm and took this photograph. And they have the, the you can see, there's a, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> there's no pointer. So you have the one person in the middle. He is the Makoto-san. He, the, he, has the, he has started helping the cucumber farming two years ago. And uh, he found out that this sorting cucumbers into an correct classes is the most tedious task. His mother spent eight hours a day for classifying each cucumber based on its shape or length or color into nine different classes. And he really didn't want it to help her. <laughs> so instead, he downloaded TensorFlow and did his own cucumber sorter. <laughs> so what he did is took a 9,000 photograph of the different cucumbers and put the labels uh, crushed by the, uh, his mother and trained the TensorFlow model by himself. And he built this sort of robotics by himself by spending $1,500. And the TensorFlow model is, is running on the Raspberry Pi to detect the uh, cucumbers put on the plate. And it can classify the cucumbers uh, into nine different classes based on its shape and colors. And this is a system diagram of the systems. So it has three parts. The Arduino micro is used for controlling the servers and motors. And Raspberry Pi is, uh, has a camera to take a picture of the cucumbers on the plate. And it runs the very small TensorFlow model on it. And this is actually a really great example how you can split the task, the workload for machine learning into an edge device and cloud part. Because he found out running the whole set of the uh, TensorFlow model inside Raspberry Pi is too heavy weighted, so decided to split into two, two, two tasks. So the TensorFlow model running on Raspberry Pi only detects whether there's a cucumber on the plate or not. And only when it detects the, uh, there's a cucumber on the plate, it sends the picture to the server, 
where he has the more powerful TensorFlow model that can classify the cucumber into nine different classes. So let's take a look, look at the another interesting applications running on Android and iOS. That is a gymnastic exercise scorer. What is that? The actually, every Japanese knows uh, the exercise called radio exercise. Because we have a national broadcasting, radio broadcasting network, they play the same exercise music at the same time every morning. And tens of millions of Japanese people are doing the same exercise every morning. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this application is designed to uh, record the scores or how well you have been doing the, your exercise with the music. And uh, to capture the motions uh, with the uh, motion sensor, they have used the TensorFlow. And they were able to train the TensorFlow model to capture and extract the patterns or features from the uh, data from the motion sensors so that it is able to evaluate the, the motions made by human hand. And they also built their own TensorFlow compiler uh, so that they were able to apply the techniques such as the quantization or approximations and they were able to uh, reduce the uh, TensorFlow model from tens of megabytes into a few megabytes. So that was the key technology uh, to build the uh, production quality uh, Android and iOS applications with the TensorFlow power. So let's take a look at the live demonstration of the exercise scorer. So can I switch to the... Uh, So this is the applications where you can choose the various kinds of the exercises. And I'll be playing the most standard one. So, so this is the music. <laughs> So just like that. So let's stop. <laughs> oh. It's enough. It's enough. Enough. <laughs> So now the TensorFlow model is trying to evaluate how well you have done with the exercise. And you can see the bar chart here. That is the evaluation by the uh, TensorFlow model inside these applications. It's a real thing. OK? So go back to the uh, slide. So that was the thing uh, we wanted to show. And so in this session, we have learned many things, including the one, yet another weird thing from Japan, <laughs> and, uh, new tech and uh, some uh, optimization techniques for the uh, building a TensorFlow applications with the production quality Android and iOS applications. And if you are interested, please go to the tensorflow.org, uh, where you can have the, uh, lots of the uh, getting started materials. And there are also uh, some of the good uh, code labs on the code lab website. OK? Thank you so much. Thank you.